Welcome back, everyone. Well, it is the week of the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. Uh, the Gettysburg Address was uh, delivered uh, famously in November of 1863 at the dedication of the new National Cemetery in Gettysburg, where I'm heading this week. I will actually be there in Gettysburg this weekend uh, for those anniversary events, which will include uh, them putting, uh, I believe, um, candles at each of the 3,500 or so Union uh, dead, uh, their graves there. And I'll, I'll definitely do some video of that for you guys for the channel, along with my other content I'll be making for Gettysburg. But I thought it would be great to spend a little time talking about the Gettysburg Address, the history behind it. Uh, we're going to start off by using uh, my friends at the American Battlefield Trust, their video uh, on the Gettysburg Address in four minutes. But then I want to share some additional background information. I want to talk a little bit about Edward Everett, who was the main speaker that day. We're going to take a look at a newspaper article from November 21st of 1863 and see how uh, it was received, see some of the information. It actually has a bunch of uh, uh, excerpts from Ed, uh, Edward Everett's uh, speech as well as description of when and where the applause was during Lincoln's speech as well as a transcript of a speech uh, given by Secretary of State Seward who was also present uh, in Gettysburg for the ceremonies. So uh, we'll take a look at all of that after we watch this video. So let's go ahead and start with this. The Battle of Gettysburg was the single bloodiest event to take place in the history of the American Civil War. When it was all said and done, over 10,000 Americans had lost their lives. And from all of this death and devastation, people began to ask themselves a number of important questions. First and foremost, what does it all mean? What are we to take from all of this death and carnage? Yeah, so it's important for us to kind of step back and think about how the nature of the reasons for the war was changing at this point. Uh, by 1863, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation has been issued and taken effect. It was issued uh, in September of 62 after the Battle of Antietam. It takes effect on January 1st of 1863. Uh, at that point, the... Um, nature of the war starts to change. It's no longer just about preserving the Union. It's also about something greater. It's about uh, ending slavery. Of course, there's a lot of work that needs to be done before that can happen. Uh, there's going to have, have to be a constitutional amendment that's passed and ratified. Uh, but it's the start of that. Uh, but it's also a time when the draft is instituted. And so around the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, you have draft riots taking place, which involve lynching of African-Americans in New York City, uh, which is kind of some backlash against the changing nature of the war. Uh, and so by November of 1863, you have all of that going on. And the war is just getting increasingly bloody. And after Gettysburg, after Chickamauga, the two bloodiest battles of the war, there still seems to be no end in sight is the preservation of the Union, or the abolishment of slavery for that matter, truly worth all of this human loss? All of these questions would perhaps best be answered four months later in what would become one of the most famous speeches in all of world history. That speech would be the Gettysburg Address, delivered by President Abraham Lincoln right here on this hillside in Gettysburg. Lincoln was invited here for a November 19th dedication ceremony to dedicate this Soldiers National Cemetery, the final resting place of over 3,500 Union soldiers who gave their lives in this battle. Lincoln is not the main speaker for this dedication ceremony, and thus he's going to keep his comments rather short and sweet. Yeah, and he needs to because Edward Everett's speech, by all accounts, goes about two hours. Uh, I've seen entire fronts of newspapers with just the highlights of his speech, like in six columns with really small type, and they, they, they'll give excerpts from it, and then they'll say, and then he talked about this, 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 and this, and then he said this. Uh, like So they only give parts of it. And I, I don't know if there's any really easily accessible 
publication that shows the whole thing, but it was really extensive. And so that was why Lincoln recognized he needed to keep it brief. Um, you know, a few appropriate remarks is what he was asked to do. It was almost like a courtesy thing. Edward Everett was known by and large to be like the, one of the greatest orators of their day. Uh, this was a guy who, when we get to the end of this, we'll talk a little bit more about his resume because he's got quite a resume. But he will eventually rise from the speaker's platform and he will begin his address by stating that it had only been 87 years earlier that this nation had been established under the promise that all men are created equal. And fun little fact here, this scene that's famously depicted never took place. Uh, you've got the five men here who were the committee that put together the uh, Declaration of Independence. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and, and in this painting, by the way, Thomas Jefferson is stomping on John Adams' toes in the painting, which I always thought was a nice touch. Um, but no, they they kind of signed here and there. Some of them signed in July, some, a bunch of them signed on August 2nd, and they kind of signed whenever they were in and out. There was no big like group time when they all signed at once. He later goes on to say how this awful civil war was worth fighting. Lincoln realized that the fight for freedom in America had been altered here in this very spot. In Lincoln's view, the United States is the last best hope for free people on earth. And in his view, that was something that was worth fighting for. And he urges his fellow Americans to consider what is at stake. He speaks of this unfinished work which this nation must embark on, winning this awful civil war. And indeed, the war would continue, claiming over 620,000 lives in the process. Depending on whose numbers you look at, that's the common figure that has been accepted for most of the last 150 years. But in recent years, uh, a lot of folks have been kind of reevaluating that, and I've seen a lot of estimates that have pushed it up closer to about 750,000. Abraham Lincoln being among the last of them. Many people in America in the 1860s don't have the basic rights of citizenship. They include women, African Americans, and Native Americans. Although they don't have the rights of citizenship at this time, it is Lincoln's words spoken here at Gettysburg that are embodied in their movements to obtain those basic American rights, such as casting their vote in an election, letting their voice be heard in a free democracy. This was some of the work Abraham Lincoln spoke of. And in many ways, the unfinished work goes on to this very day. Hmm. Wherever there is oppression, wherever there is injustice, there's work still left to be done. And this is the great task remaining, not only for the generation of the 1860s, but for all generations. All right, so I'll put a link in the description uh, to that original video by our friends at the American Battlefield Trust. I will be joining Gary Edelman, their chief historian, this weekend in Gettysburg for an all-day battlefield walk. Pretty excited about that, and I'll definitely be bringing you the highlights uh, from that day. But let's take a look a little deeper at some of this stuff. So let's talk a little bit about Edward Everett first. Here you have him here. He's born in 1794, dies right at the end of the Civil War. So he dies about a year and a half after his speech at Gettysburg. He had been uh, the running mate uh, for John Bell on the Constitutional Union ticket in the 1860 election. Uh, he was the Secretary of State briefly under Millard Fillmore. He's a senator briefly from Massachusetts. He's the governor of Massachusetts back in the 1830s. He's a congressman from Massachusetts from 1825 to 1835. Uh, so he's a pretty young congressman. He's like 30, what, 30 years old when he's elected to Congress. Um, he serves as the U.S. Minister to the United Kingdom. He's the president of Harvard University. Uh, you know, this guy had an extensive resume. He's known as a great speaker. Um, he's got some, some famous relatives uh, like Edward Everett uh, Hale. Uh, who was a famous uh, author. Um, Edward Everett himself is also a pastor. He's, got, he's a father of six children. Um, but, you know, he is remembered as the main speaker that day. So here is a an, um, newspaper article from November 21st, 1863. So this is like right after uh, this happens, two days after the dedication. This is the Daily Green Mountain Freeman from Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, and so they describe some of the details here uh, of what happened. They talk about the president seated between uh, Secretary of State Seward on one side and Edward Everett on the other side. 
uh, talks about there being a, uh, a reception. There are 150,000 people. Think about that. This is a town of like 2,500 people and 150,000 people descend on Gettysburg for this. Could you imagine? I mean, there was obviously nowhere for them to stay. I mean, I just can't even imagine where, obviously they didn't have all cars, you know, where they parked on their horses, things like that. Um, performance of a funeral dirge by the band. Edward Everett delivers his address and it says it was characterized by all the perfection of excellence, which has given Mr. Everett's uh, a reputation uh, as first among American orators. And it gives a bunch of the excerpts from uh, Edward Everett's speech. But what I want to talk about briefly is two things. Number one, I want to look at what it says about Lincoln's speech here um, because it gives the details of where the crowd breaks into applause. And I thought that was kind of interesting. So we'll read the Gettysburg Address and then look at that. Uh, it says, the President Lincoln uh, then delivered the following dedicatory speech. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And then there's a pause for applause. Now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have, uh, it says we are met, but I think he said we have come to dedicate a portion of it uh, of that battlefield as a final resting place of those who have given their lives that the nation may live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot ha hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor, it says our power, but I believe he said our poor power to add or detract. So there's a few mistakes in this newspaper article and you figure they're probably writing it down or they're probably getting a copy from someone else, but it should say add or detract. There's applause there. The world will, lit, and I believe, I'm just gonna say as I think it actually was rather than what the newspaper says, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. And then there's applause again. And that's one of my favorite lines of the whole thing. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work that they have thus far so nobly carried on, or some, sometimes I see it as so nobly advanced. Again, applause. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. And then there's a break for applause. That the nation shall, under God, have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Long continued applause. Now... Lincoln supposedly after that turned to one of his aides and made some comment about how the speech wasn't really going to be received well. Um, and, you know, there were some newspapers who criticized the speech as basically being like beneath the dignity of the office of the presidency and stuff like that. But almost immediately, there was a very, very positive response to the speech. You know, unlike how some people spin it that it took a long time before it was appreciated. No, it was it was appreciated pretty much instantly by a lot of people. But there were some people who were critical. And you have to remember, you know, just like today, you're going to have... Um, you're going to have some media that are going to be positive and some that are not. But it was very well received by a lot of people. Uh, and I agree, one of the greatest speeches ever given in the English language, uh, certainly here in America, uh, though I still like President Lincoln's second inaugural address better than the Gettysburg Address, but it's fantastic. And we're going to talk more about that when I go to Gettysburg this weekend. All right, one more thing I want to highlight before before we finish up, and that is that uh, you have here Secretary Seward, the Secretary of State, um, in response to a serenade at Gettysburg, made a brief speech, which is reported as follows. He said he was 60 years of age. He had been 40 years in public life. This, however, was the first time he'd ever dared to address people residing upon the border of Maryland. You have to remember, uh, William Seward, is uh, he was one of the radical abolitionists in the Republican Party. 
and when and he was kind of the favored to be the Republican nominee in 1860. It was kind of a big deal that he lost that nomination to Abraham Lincoln, who was more of a moderate. Uh, so Seward, you know, is not well liked in uh, slave states at all. Uh, he anticipated 40 years ago that the battle of freedom would be fought on this ground and that slavery would die. Loud cheering. Uh, there has been a great issue. The people, uh, great, uh, there had been a great issue between the people of this country, north and south, and it was now being determined in this contest. He had been anxious to see slavery die by peaceful means and moral means, if possible, and now he was determined to see it die by the fates of war. Applause. This Pennsylvania, beautiful, capacious, rich, and fertile, was an evidence of what the spirit of freedom had done for the Union. He would not abandon the contest until he had one hope, one country, one destiny, and one nationality. Loud applause. So there you have it. Just a little bit more information about what happened in November of 1863. Uh, I am off to New York City today to speak at uh, some schools in Setauket on Long Island. I'll be home tomorrow night. So um, in the meantime, be thinking about what you want to see from Gettysburg when I head there this weekend. I'll be off to Washington, D.C. on Friday and then into Gettysburg uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. I'll be on my way home. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you again soon.